up until three o'clock this morning. Uh, there was a youth trip to Carowinds last month, and, and t- it wears you out, doesn't it? It doesn't, I mean, it just wears you out. Um, I did not go. I was just at home waiting. <laughs> I have no excuses. I don't have a reason to be worn out this morning. Um, but I, I want to I remind you, but let's be engaged now. I know I'm about to talk, and if, and if I were in your seat, after about seven or eight minutes, I would tune me out. Um, so let's really listen to what God has to say. I really want this to be a moment where this, the Holy Spirit breathes through this place and, and creates life inside of us, changes us, and convicts us. We, we want um, supernatural this morning, don't we? We want to participate in the supernatural. So that means that you're going to have to do the work because I can't do the supernatural for you. I'm just Daniel. So let's, let's engage together. Um, John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6 is where we're going to be today. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to pull out there. Um, in the, the dividing land between Laos and Vietnam, the dividing land, the borderline between Laos and Vietnam is not so well defined. Uh, for decades, uh, the way that the people uh, determined which nationality, which, which kingdom they lived in, whether Laos or Vietnam, on the border was that if you liked short grain rice and built your house on stilts, you were a Laos citizen. If you liked long grain rice and built your house on the ground, then you were Vietnamese. That sounds so... um, Well, it sounds like something that I would do. If you like long grain rice, you're from Vietnam. If If your heart is sold, if you love to make and eat... Short grain rice, then you're from Laos. Okay, just just hold on for a second. What I'm really trying to tell you is, is that sometimes where our heart is, is what kingdom we belong to. What I love, what I prefer, is what kingdom I belong to. Now, you can tell me I love Jesus. I, I don't have any magic glasses that enables me to look into your heart. But where your heart resides, what captivates your heart, what's actually inside of your heart, what you love, could that be the kingdom that you live in? I'm going to ask you a question at the end. I'm going to ask it to you right now. Is it possible today? Is it possible that you're living in the wrong kingdom? Is it possible that your heart belongs to the wrong kingdom? Is it possible that you love the wrong kingdom? Um, John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. Uh, this passage absolutely means a whole lot to me. Um, it's near and dear to my heart. It helps me to get, get through some really hard times. Um, so, so let's look at this passage together. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said, love Thomas. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, so invade this space. So invade this space that we move to normal, to supernatural. Fill our hearts, breathe life into us. Guide us before the Father that we might properly worship Him. Enable our worship that enable us to hear clearly what God is saying. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Great passage. Starts off maybe in a spot that many of us can identify with today. Um, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Uh, Do not be anxious. Do not be stressed out. Uh, Do you have things in your life right now that you're anxious about? Some stuff that's weighing you down. Stressing you out. 
Look, uh, this is a big deal. I believe we live in an epidemic of people who don't know how to cope with things anymore. We don't know how to cope with things. Um, and my prime example is actually teenagers um, and young adults. I, I believe this happened sometime right after the 9-11 movement um, and that tragedy, but we just got to a point where we couldn't deal with stuff anymore. Uh, last year, uh, Carter came to um, exam time, um, uh, national uh, standard testing time, and he is flipping out. I mean, he's just crying, thinks he's not going to pass, thinks the world is going to end over a test. Now, I could preach to you a sermon about a standardized test, but I also preach Carter a sermon. There are bigger things coming up in life than that test. And if you can't handle that, I mean, we, we've lost the ability to cope. Jesus has just told his disciples in John chapter 13 that he's about to die and leave them. And this is really ruining their theology because they really did think that Jesus was coming to liberate the people of Israel. And they had put all of their heart and stock into that. And if he was coming to liberate the people of Israel, now he's about to die. Those two things don't go together for them. They, they're, they're really upset about this. And so he looks to them and he says, don't let your hearts, don't be, let what's in your heart trouble you. If what's in your heart is troubling you in a negative way, then can we just ask the question, is Jesus in my heart? It's not one of my favorite phrases. Like, I, like to, to lead somebody to Christ, I don't like to say to invite Jesus into your heart. I, that just, I like to say, would you follow Jesus for the rest of your life? But I think today the question's appropriate. If my heart is troubled, what's inside of it? And Jesus answers with this wonderful reply. I mean, I wish that there was a switch, don't you? Where you could go, no longer afraid, you know, not anxious. You know, go over to the switch. I'm not going to be stressed out today. Don't you wish there was a switch for that? Because we know that fear, anxiety... Stress is the food of Satan. He can use that to paralyze our lives. Our spiritual relationships with God become paralyzed when we are more focused on fear and anxiety or those things that cause fear and anxiety rather than on God. Because it brings up this ultimate question. What do you trust more? Who do you trust more? Do you trust that you can't pay a bill right now over the Savior who died for our sins? Do you, do you trust, um, excuse me, your, your, your relationship with a significant person, thinking that, that that's going to you know, make or break your life, or do you trust the Savior that died for your sins? I mean, it, it, what do you trust? What's in your heart? That's how Jesus responds. And it's not flippant, it's actually just right. Okay, but it is kind of short. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. You put your stock in God. You understand Him to be creator, designer. You know that He called the Messiah. If you believed in God, then believe in what I can do too. Believe also in me. And not just, to, not just like believe like I believe that the Ten Commandments are a good set of rules. It's, again, it's much deeper than that. It's where's your heart? Where's your stock? Um, and then there's this wonderful promise. Uh, in my, father, my father's house has many rooms. Uh, now we have got some bad theology on this song. On this, excuse me, on this thing right here. Um, I, and I kind of want to point it out for a few minutes because I like to poke fun at it. This does not say that you have a mansion in glory. It says Jesus has a mansion in glory and you have a room inside of it. Okay? This does not say that you're going to get whatever you want when you get to heaven and it's going to be the coolest thing in the world. Chocolate ice cream, Rocky Road, whatever. This does not say that. This says that Jesus has a house. And in his house, he has prepared, prepared an abiding place. for. These are the perfect words. John says them in John chapter 15. He has a place for you to indwell. It's you in Jesus. So he says here, not that you have a mansion in glory, but my Father has a house. I have prepared you a place. It's been prepared a long time ago. I'm preparing it now. And he says, uh, 
if it were not so. This is what I would say. I'm not a liar. God is not a liar. This is the promise. And the promise is contingent that Jesus has to go. There's a work to be done that Jesus couldn't stay here and do. He had to go to complete the work that He was going to do. And so what I'm telling you is, the promise is, is that Jesus went and did the work. We know He did the work, didn't we? We know He died on the cross. We know He rose again. Then let's trust Him with our lives. Let's trust that He's going to come back and get us. Let's trust that He's not the liar. Let's trust that He's going to come back. And this is the great promise. And take us to where He is. But now we're going to move from location to something a little bit deeper. Okay? Because we like the mansion in glory. We like the unlimited ice cream bar because we're stuck on a location. He's not stuck on the location. Look at the, the end of that second phrase. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may be in my Father's house. No, that's not what it says. That you may, that you may have a king-sized bed be able to rest well at night. I mean, I, you know I'm poking fun about this because of how important this is. I'm going to take you to be with me. The prize of heaven is Jesus Christ. The great glory of heaven is not an unlimited ice cream bar. That you, that your, your glory of heaven is not that one day you're going to be healed. That's a byproduct of who Jesus Christ is. The glory of heaven is Jesus Christ. Our great joy for heaven is Jesus Christ. Christ. This is an eternal perspective. This is New Testament Christian theology. He's coming back and He's going to take me there. But when we get so caught up like I do overstressed short-sighted then I miss the kingdom. My heart starts loving a little bit more of what I can do than what he's already done. I want to show you a little video, um, if I could. Just a little video. Uh, It's pretty stark, and it's going to hit you right here. Okay? Jesus, I just don't trust you. You don't trust me? No, I mean, I want to trust you. I just don't. (laughs) I have an exercise that I think will really help you. Oh, okay. Stand here and face this direction. Mm -hmm. Now, do you trust me? Uh, No, I just said I don't trust you. Well, this is all part of the exercise. Oh, All right. Okay. Whenever I ask you if you trust me, you say, yes, Jesus, I trust you. Even though I don't. It's practice. Okay. So, do you trust me? Uh, yes, Jesus, I trust you. Now, fall back. Are you going to catch me? Don't worry about that part. Okay, that's the part I'm worried about. <laughs> you can do this, okay? Just trust me. Trust you. Fall back. Okay, well, Jesus, I trust Good. you. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's great. Uh, okay. Let's try this again. Just face this direction and keep your feet planted. Yeah. All right? Do you trust me? Yes, Jesus, I trust you. Now, fall back. Okay. I'm going to do it. All right. I'm really going to do it. <laughs> okay. Good. Ah! Oh, Jesus, you really caught me. Yeah. I didn't think you were going to catch me, but you did. Oh, that was <laughs> great. That was great. You're ready for level two. Level two, here yes. I come, baby. Woo! Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> okay, hold it. <laughs> oh, you know what? You're too close. You need to move back. <laughs> ah, right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> this one's a little bit different, Laura. Oh, okay. Uh, stand here. Uh-huh. But face me. Oh, forward fall. Okay. I can do that. Wait. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. Um, wait for my signal. Oh, right. The Jesus signal. <laughs> yes, the okay. Jesus signal. Do you trust me? Yes, Jesus. I trust you so much. Good. Fall back. <laughs> That's awesome. It is awesome. <laughs> Especially when you do it. <laughs> Seriously? Of course. Okay, Jesus, I don't know if you noticed this, but there is nobody over there. I know it looks that way to you. <laughs> it looks that way. It is that way. You can do this, Laura. Just trust me and fall back. <laughs> Jesus, I can't do that. We can do it together. I can't. You can. I won't. Very stark. 
We say that we trust Jesus. We get a little bit of experience in trusting Jesus. And we say that we trust Jesus. And it's not about our location. Because who was right there? Jesus. It's about where her heart was. She really didn't trust him. Because no matter what, your heart cannot trump your location. If your heart's somewhere else, it doesn't matter the environment that you're in. You're going to be stressed out. You're going to be over-anxious. You're going to be caught up in fear. If Jesus doesn't own your heart, then, then that has issues for your eternal you know, destination. If Jesus doesn't own your heart, that says a lot about who you say that you are. And I don't, I don't mean to try to, to, to cause you to question things, but I do have a question for you. What if your heart belongs to something else today? What if all of those things that you're thinking about that right now you've given your heart over to, you shouldn't have done that. And today's God saying, don't give your heart there. It's going to cause you trouble and anxiety. Give your heart to me. Trust me. Because don't you think that the God of the universe who is standing in front of this young lady who told her to fall backwards can't catch her from behind at the same time. Don't you trust that the God who you try to put in front of you all the time, in front of your face all the time, will be there to catch you if He's in front of you? He will be. He always is. Um, the, the story continues because, again, Thomas, I'm a Thomas. I am a Thomas. Are you a Thomas? I am absolutely a Thomas. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe also in me. You get this great crescendo. I'm going to prepare a place for you. You're kind of triumphant. Yes, Jesus, I believe. And then, then he says, you know the place to where I am going. By this time, we get the idea that, that the disciples maybe should have known more than they did. Or trusted more than they did. I mean, Jesus kind of lays it all out there for them. And then he looks at them and says, you guys know where I'm going. Why is this so confusing to you? Thomas re responds the way I would have responded. I may be out of juice here. Uh, Matthew, can you trip along for me? Thomas responds here the way that we would respond. Lord, we don't, we don't know the way. How, how can we know the way? And if I were Thomas, this is one of the two things I would think. I think it's all about inflection. You know, all about the way that you read something or hear something. I don't know if uh, he meant it this way, but maybe he was like, well, we don't know the way you're going. You know, kind of, kind of sheepishly. You know, or, or maybe it was more, more sarcastic. We don't know where you're going. You know what I'm saying, right? Maybe he looked at him and said, you always speak in parables and poems and we just don't get it. You're always talking about some riddle in some place that I've never been to. Look, I, there was a person um, the, in Kern County, um, Oklahoma. This is 2013. Um, they were driving their RV to go to a local campground um, and they were following the GPS. And the GPS um, uh, started leading them down this dirt road. Have your, has your GPS ever sent you to a place that you just didn't feel good about? So they're going to camp with their friends, and I can understand, going to camp, and, and sometimes campgrounds have dirt roads on them. But they started traveling about an hour or so down this road, dirt road. You know, you can't go fast on an RV, so maybe they only made it about 10 miles or so. They told them to take a right turn down another dirt road. They started to get really nervous when they said the trees started closing in on them. And it, 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 they made it to a soft spot that day, and their RV actually got stuck. They said, oh, well, we've got an RV. We'll just spend the night. It'll dry out sometime tonight, tomorrow morning, and we'll be able to get right out. The only problem was it didn't dry out. So they stayed. Not one night. They stayed seven nights stuck in the middle of nowhere. And I, I tell you this because at what point were they driving down this road for an hour that somebody didn't go, maybe we should call one of our friends. One of our friends said, hey, I, I don't think this looks familiar. You know, t tell me, I, this, is just, this doesn't feel good. 
at what point, sitting in an RV, stuck in the mud, did somebody not go, well, maybe we need to call a tow truck? You know? Been here for a few years. Finally, after seven days, they called the local sheriff. Sheriff's office came out and helped them out. Now, you, we shake our heads at them, but how many times have we given our hearts down a path? We know it didn't feel good. You know, we, we, we know something didn't seem just quite right. We know it wasn't biblical and it wasn't godly, but we kept going anyways. And now, now we're at some place and we don't feel comfortable. Too stressed out, too anxious. No wonder. But let's be like Thomas. How many times have you heard a pastor say, be like Thomas? Maybe we should be like Thomas and just ask. We don't know the way. Can you please help us, Jesus? Maybe that needs to be your prayer today. Jesus, I'm in a spot. I don't know how I got there. I don't know what's going on. Please help me. Maybe, maybe you need to say, Jesus, my heart's burdened and broken. I've been beating my head against the wall. I don't know how to make it out of here. Please help me. Maybe. The, the passage closes. Let's see if I got juice today. Oh, yeah. I'm back to power. And Jesus said to him, Again, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered. It's that, it's that beautiful phrase. We, we know this phrase, don't we? I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Like we say that, like it rolls off of our tongue. There's a, there's a lot of huge theological statements here. In, in this passage, Jesus is identifying himself with God. He's much more than doing that. He's saying that he and God are basically doing the same things. Do you remember last week we were looking at Deuteronomy chapter 30, and I got a little loud, and I said, Today! You remember that? Because in that passage, Deuteronomy chapter 30, Moses gets the, gets the message, clearly says, Lord God, you are the life. And what does Jesus here say? I am. I am, and there is none other. It's not like I am with 15 other things. It's I am, and there is nothing else. I am the way, the pathway, the, the passage, the only accessible route to God. I am. I, I am the truth. Not a truth statement like 2 plus 2 is 4. He is the original truth. Uh, the word truth actually has a lot to do with fidelis, which is as close to the original as possible. Jesus is the closest to the original as possible. Why? Because he is the original. He's not a carbon copy. He's not a regurgitated truth. He's not another truth statement. He is the truth, the source of reality. He is it. Then he says, I am the life. The, the Zoe here in Greek, it is the, the, the life, if, if you could live a life, if you could live a life where you could just walk into heaven, that's the life it's talking about. If, if you could live a life that was so great, so good, so joyful, so loving, so fulfilling in every single way that you could just walk into heaven, that's the life this is talking about. Jesus is saying, I am those things. Now, we're really good with that. Like, we're like, yes, way to go, Jesus. Like, if we were a cheerleader today for Jesus, this would be the spot we would be cheerleading, wouldn't we? This is where it gets rough. Definitive, gracious statement. So gracious. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. Well, where's your heart? Because if your heart's someplace else, you're not going to find the fulfillment you want. It only comes through Jesus Christ. You might think that you have the pathway, the bridge, the way. You might think you have a, a handle on a kernel of the truth. It's not a destination. It's a person. And what's in your heart will never trump that place. That place that nobody else knows about. That place that maybe hides your secret sin, your secret fears your public sin or your public fears. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Um, let, me, let, me, let me explain this with a few cultural terms. Can I do that? 
I'm going to do it, so just hold on. Uh, the first one is, is that uh, in, in our culture today, and again, I'm a Gen Xer, and I think Gen X ruined the world. Um, and I'm not joking. I really think we ruined the world because we, we I, th- I feel like we started this idea of, you know, we want it our way. And not only do we want it our way, as long as it's not hurting you, why are you fighting me about my way? Just let me live my way. I, I'm going to call that um, moral deism for a minute. Okay, deism, though, has to do with God. And so what we've gotten to do the point to the point today where where we believe that it's possible that I can earn my way to heaven. That I can work. And this is a lot of religions. Some of us Christians. I believe if I obey the Ten Commandments good enough. Or if I'm a good enough person. That if I give enough or I'm social enough. I, I was looking at a guy just the other day. I asked him if he was going to go to heaven. I was in his house. He said, well, I, I live a pretty good life. The only problem with that is that if, if my deism, if my, my, my eternity, my, my making it to God is based on what I can do, then there becomes an, an awful duplicity. Because I can do something on the outside and not feel like it on the inside. Husbands, how many times has your wife told you to change a light bulb and you didn't feel like it? Vice versa. Wives, how many times your husband asked you to do something? You didn't feel like doing it, but you did it anyways, didn't you? Not because you didn't love them. So you had an outward act that didn't fit the inside of your heart at that moment. But the same can be true for, for my works. And what, I, what, if, what if I could do great works on the outside, but it's totally filthy on the inside? I know that part. Uh, after um, 9-11, again, after 9-11... Um, they, they went into those men's, those terrorist hotel rooms. You know what they found? The night before the act, they had had some pretty wild parties. Um, they had rented uh, lots of inappropriate things to watch. There were lots of alcohol and other things that were there. Now, they would say that they were doing the right, a great outward act, but the inside, Filthy. That's why moral, de- excuse me, moral deism doesn't work out for us. Um, by the way, just right after that, do you know uh, what they found in the home of Osama bin Laden? Same thing. All over his computer, all in the house. Say on the outside that he's a righteous person, but on the inside. Whew. That's why moral deism is so dangerous. The other thing, though, I'm going to call is radical individualism. Radical individualism. And this is kind of what radical individualism means. Um, that you are the most important person. And since you're the most important person, nobody else should tell you what to do. But that if you follow that logically to its end point, since you're the most important person, everybody else should agree with you and do what you have to say. Everybody. That, but that means that you're the source of salvation. That you're the source of everybody else's right and wrong. And ultimately, that means that you're going to make a whole bunch of enemies because it's your way and everybody else is wrong. And if they don't agree with you, you will fight with them. You will kill with them. You will cut them down with your words. You will overstate your position because you think you're so right. Radical individualism. And we can see that on any news conference today, can't we? (laughs) But has it creeped into our hearts? And the problem with these two pathways is is that it's all about us. It's all about me. It's all about what I'm doing. And and look, um, I don't think any of you guys are terrorists. I don't think that any of you guys are really bad people. I don't. I know you. You know me. We kind of we kind of love each other. But but what if you've given your heart today to things? that are not life, and are not truth, and are not the way. What if your life is upside down, and the things that you thought were, they're not? Maybe we can just be like Thomas and say, 
there's a place that I know I should be, but I'm not. Will you help me get there? That God, God, I, I want to believe. I want to have faith. I want to. I want to be that person, but I'm not there right now. Will you show me the way? I want to show you one more clip. Remember, we watched that movie Woodlawn just for a few minutes. I want to show you another clip from Woodlawn. I want to show you just a, a mid part. What happens when we realize that the place that we thought we are is the wrong place? So what happens? I wanted to come here today because uh, five of my players are here. <clears throat> five of my players that have been mistreated time and again by their school and by their teammates. And I have not done enough to stop it. Now, at the beginning of this season, um, my team, almost my entire team, they gave themselves to love. I love that I didn't understand. I love that began to conquer hatred. And after the game on Friday, I went home. And I prayed. Not that I really know how to do that. But I told God that I don't know if you're real. But I want, I want whatever my players have. I came here today because I believe. I believe and I want to be baptized. What I'm not saying is that you're a horrible person. That's not for me. My own sin is in front of me today. My own trusting issues is in front of me. What I'm telling you is that this isn't about you. It's all about Him. This, this isn't about what you can and what you can't do. It is all about what He's already done. This isn't about, about, about where your location is. This is about who He, who he is. Where's your heart today? Where's your heart? What if you gave it all over to Jesus today? And He had every bit of it. Every nook, cranny, corner, fear, secret place. What if He had it all? What could God do with you then? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're just asking. Lost sometimes in my own sinfulness. I'm lost in my perception. I just need to know the way today. I say that I trust you, but I have so much trouble with trust, Father. So much trouble. Help me today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You respond as God has laid it on your heart. Maybe you need to come down here and say, I'm on.